Come July the 11th, we will resume with some wonderful conversationists, one of which is Linda Villarosa from the New York Times, is returning to talk about race and medicine in her new book. We also have our program chairs from all of the campuses joining in to talk about the work that's been done in this arena, as well as um, a future um, program around Central Avenue and its jazz legacy. At this moment, I would just like to invite everyone who is in this space right now. We have, of course, acknowledged the George Floyd incident, which was our Genesis story, um, the beginning of messy conversation for us. But just in yeah. the past days, we have experienced an egregious attack yet again on Black people through the hands of an avowed white supremacist. So remembering those people, those 10 people who gave up their lives just recently in Buffalo, New York, we here, the Messy Conversation team, would like to just ask you all to join us in a short 60 second reverence in a moment of silence, if you would. Ashe, and thank you all. I'm Clarence R. Williams. I am the student representative on the Messy Conversation team. And it's my esteemed pleasure to introduce our conversationists today. Uh, messy Conversations is usually, we funnel different ideas. Usually it's, it's um, real time issues that we face. And a lot of the students, myself especially, were most upset about <clears throat> the banning of the books issue and how that would affect education in the future. And so as I push the team, as they know, around the subject, I was asked, okay, well, who do you see being a conversationist? And of course, on the top of my head, the only person I could think about was Dr. Maxine Mims. So, <laughs> I went and asked Dr. Maxine Mims if she would talk on this subject. And she graciously, after I begged on bended knee, said yes. And um, she says, well, you have the agency and the authority to decide who I would converse with. And that was a no brainer. I mean, who else would you ask to speak to Dr. Maxine Mims, but Dr. Elaine Parker Gills. So I hope you guys have had the opportunity to read their bios because all I'm gonna say to you is, the reason why I chose the two of them is because how the dots are connected. They are both legendary educators in the global world. They both have created curriculums for multiple institutions. They both have created schools, founded and directed schools. So who else could better guide us through what has been in the Sankofo thought and what will be based on all the egregious politicized attacks on education that we have been experiencing. So please review your lib guide. I'm not gonna go into a lot of um, notes about who they are in the world, but what I will say is in pop culture, we refer to Dr. Gills as the notorious EBG. <laughs> And I've just renamed Dr. Mims as the notorious DMM. So <laughs> hold on to your bonnets, the wrap, the hat, your seat, or whatever you need to hold on to. But please welcome <laughs> Dr. Elaine Parker Gills in conversation with Dr. Maxine Mims on the banning of the books and the miseducation and where do we go from here? Please. Well, first of all, Thank you so much, Clarence, and I, I'm not sure, the notorious EPG. Ah, interesting. 
Well, I, it, it's a pleasure every week to be involved in Missy Conversation, but uh, I'm especially honored uh, to be in conversation with the esteemed Dr. Maxine Mims. Um, it has been a pleasure engaging with her for the past couple of weeks. And I wanted to say that um, as a longtime educator, this, this educational leader has had such an impact in many institutions and even globally. So I think that uh, Antioch University standing for social justice and progressive education, uh, this is a meeting that should have been held a long time ago. So once again, I'm very excited. And thank you also Clarence for, for leading us into um, a moment of silence as we continue this multi-layered struggle for social justice and to end systemic racism. This topic, I don't think, and Dr. Mims and I agree that speaking about racially or racial based book banning and miseducation, there's a very strong critical uh, connection. The banning of books has a lot to do with the banning of education for black folk, the assault on women that we currently see, the violence of extremists from George Floyd to this just last week in Buffalo. So we'll spend some time today getting the views and perspectives of Dr. Mims. Uh, she was once quoted as saying, my life is education and she lives it. And so we're very happy that she's gonna spend some time today. And I wanna say, here we go again, uh, not only for isolated incidents, but the Library Association has said that over 1,597 books have been challenged or actually removed from libraries. And we have from 1619 to uh, the, uh, the Bluest Eye, to All Boys Aren't Blue. There's so many books and everything based on critical race theory, which is not being taught, that there's so many things we need to clear up. But I wanna start off with asking Dr. Mims to just please give us some uh, idea where are we and why these banning of books at this particular time in history, in your view? Well, thank you so much for inviting me and it's just a pleasure to be here. But historically, if you look at the uh, what's happening, when you have Antioch, Evergreen, Prescott, Goddard, I was just trying to think of many of the universities, uh, academies that have uh, that I'm aware of that have made an effort over the years to be inclusive. And when you see the murder now, this is pure murder of legacies. This is actually taking authors and their work, their creativity, and executing them. This is not, a, this is not about books. This is actually killing people killing our future, killing our present, really, and certainly taking the Sankofa bird and executing it, wiping it out. And we have in these various universities, particularly I challenge Evergreen, my, my own, uh, to be bold and know that we're tired of being murdered. You, you, you can't take Toni Morrison and Amaya Angelou and, uh, nowadays 16, 19, and not integrate those bold women who said, here is a story. And I think the story will help you be a, a better whole person. And we, in higher ed, we cannot go back to the town and gown philosophy and that image and wallow in that image and feel comfortable. All 
higher ed people now, particularly the PhDs. That is a doctorate of philosophy. We have to philosophize about how much more murdery, first degree murder of the spirit can we accept? Uh, banning is, is the, the, and, and you have to watch this seductive language. Uh, you the, to just talk about it's like going from urban renewal to gentrification. They're the same. Every ten years, you'll notice some language changes, and then in higher ed, we begin to research and work on that. We have to be bold and speak out about we're tired of being executed. Our peers, our colleagues, our people who are helping us live. The, I think it's horrible what's going on. And maybe we can start from uh, looking in language at nursery rhymes, how we've been colonized to believe something. I mean, uh, we, we have to understand that uh, the Wizard of Oz was our original stupid, awful Donald Trump. Uh, Goldilocks has never been charged with breaking and entering. Mm. Uh, we have accepted those uh, images from nursery rhymes and now we're adults talking about banning books. We've never faced what that colonization and the acceptance of privilege has done to us. All of us, it has done damage to America. Now we're trying to find a way uh to get out of it the the uh january 6th committee is trying to attack and look at the constitution and its language and everybody that participated may get away with it that is public banning of behavior that's a banning of an image same and we're right here everybody is banning all books it's horrible. Yes, now the, and the impact, and, and I certainly agree, and I think there should be a focus in higher ed and how we look at injustice and how the critical engagement in the classroom and relations right. between uh, students and, and, um, and teachers and teachers and administration and community and the uh, universities. This decolonization uh, process takes many forms. When you, when you say my life is education and you are founder of the program at Tacoma uh, Evergreen, how did you, first of all, what were your experiences like at the very beginning? Because I, I saw in some of the literature you saying that it was, uh, you never before has saw complete whiteness and so a clear blackness in terms of surroundings. So what practices did you uh, see that needed to be developed and, developed and what type of relationships? I had to design my own nursery rhymes. I had to start at preschool with myself and I had to take language from my family seriously. I had to ask, go to my parents and ask them their ancestors and, and uh, what way uh, I had to take all of my senses, touch, vision, hearing, uh, tasting. I had to go to those senses and bring them alive again. Education deadens our senses unless we become bold to restore them. We've got to restore our taste buds. We can't just keep adding salt to the meal. We just have to have the meal bland and imagine that we have salt. We've got to strengthen in higher ed. We've got to strengthen our imagination. We've got to decompartmentalize. Evergreen and an Antioch and a Goddard all must get together with bold language and bold images and say, you will not buy, ban books in the Pacific Northwest. And I'm using that as an example. Mm -hmm. We must collaborate with the language of making a covenant with each other and go to the meta language of understanding. We can do it if higher ed would be bold enough to take a chance on revisiting language. Yes, the power of language. Uh, 
And Carter Woodson oh, yes. in The Miseducation of the Negro, 1933, yes. stated much the same even then. And he said the system uh, does not even work well for white folks or those that oppress. So certainly not for, uh, and today people of color and other marginalized groups. And I, I saw a quote somewhere, the mere imparting of education is not uh, education. The, hmm. the information is information, but education, critical education is another uh, level of, of learning. And what has been- Well, we've, your, got, to, we've got to, yeah. Actually, yeah, we've got to actually look at, uh, We've got to take two words, learning and knowledge. We've got to take those two words and really in higher education work with them. We owe it to the world to spend time on those two, not building new departments because the new departments, will, the different departments will come. It'll come out of the, applauding the imagination, revisiting that. But learning and knowledge has to be really brought to the forefront and really dissected. Yes, absolutely. Uh, yeah. over, the, over the years, there have been uh, various focus on education in terms of uh, Afrocentric view uh, or in the more historical sense of Booker T. Washington and Du Bois, classic education and you know, uh, nationalist education. In your view, can there be some integration of the two ideas in terms of how, what we face today that we can engage and really impact on a, even a, a global level? We could if we formed, if we got comfortable with interdisciplinary uh, models. Yeah, if we could begin bringing all of this, if we could be begin bringing the artist, the painter in with the physicist, and if we begin to remove the pathology of the discipline of psychology and sociology, if those two departments, hmm. psychology and sociology, would go in with the scientists and let the imagination, we could do something. But as long as there are departments with their own language and that language never is integrated, it's just gonna be hard. I just made a decision. I'm so grateful to Evergreen because I was able to bring, we're, we're able to bring a lot of that together and I was able to bring it to the adult black community. And uh, you stay, get the creativity and the imagination stirred up again which brought in some language, and then we were able to integrate quite a bit. But you do have to integrate the disciplines because the disciplines, uh, the separation of the disciplines is what makes money and keeps us apart. So it's very difficult to deal with uh, learning and knowledge. That's how you end up, I mean, if you do an interdisciplinary approach to living, that problem solving, you wouldn't be talking about banning books, you'd be bringing in every book you can think of because those books will help you grow. We're not, right now, we're not interested in being whole persons. We're interested in fragmentation and competition. And we've got to get to uh, collaboration and team building. And I think, I think the Evergreens and the Antiochs of the world can do it uh, if they would, uh, stop being arrogant about their liberalism. Mm. What I've noticed also when we're, we're looking at really trying to transformational um, knowledge and, and institutions transforming is some connection with community. And in particular in higher education, how can we uh, really begin that process, that interchange of ideas and being more involved in community uh, action. I mean, all around us are so the issues of social justice and how we as uh, individuals and various departments and institutions and communities, because even you said that you had to go to the very roots of your, your history with parents in terms of the language and culture. How can right. we begin to do right. that, you think? 
Well, and, and as academicians, we have to put our degrees in our community. We have to do what, one of the reasons I like people who are journalists, uh, they have to report on so much and they have to integrate that language in order to tell the story in order to receive it. There, it's, it's a, it's a, journalism is a really a department that we could do a lot in this country uh, in showing public collaboration. You have to, you have to put the degree in the community and let it work for the community. It, it, it can no longer be felt like uh, it's something. That's what it was, it, you know, it was all about. That's what those gowns are all about, a town and gown. You separate the town from the gown. That's what this is all about, the, the stoic Black philosophical thought. Uh, and I, and the hierarchical, we, we've been colonized that way to believe that. And now it's, you know, the, it, we have to put that degree in our communities. We have to allow our community to use our names and be, we may not always be able to be physically present, but emotionally we can always be present. And, and oh, elementary school children. Oh, I, yes. uh, mm -hmm. Is that you? Yeah, I would just say, go on to continue. I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. No, I, you know, I allow my name to be used in the elementary school by the little children. And little children now will say, see that lady? She owns all of the schools in America. Mm. That's a good image. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Because they think as I go there and work with them and talk about education, I'm in their corner, kindergarten, first grade, whatever, but I own all the schools. When I first opened the Evergreen, I was, I'm right in the inner city. I was on a street called K Street. And I always participated in the parades because one little boy told me that he thought I was in a church choir because of the robe. And I thought, my goodness, these children don't see robes on a regular enough basis except on Sunday. And of course, they wouldn't see me in the university or college because my robe represents the choir. So oh, wow. from that little child, I started being in parades. And now uh, fam uh, children will say, no, oh. she belongs to Evergreen. They've been able over the years to narrow it down that I belong to a school mm -hmm. that I don't own. A robe can be worn in a school and they understand that. We have to expose them to our presence as much as we can, to our literature as much as we can, and our name. If you can't get the body out there, let that name go into any community and affirm and confirm them. Yeah, in, in Los Angeles, the, our, at our campus, we've uh, really expanded, uh, not obviously the last couple of years, although even the last couple of years, we've entered some programs and brought kids to Zoom and then there's been a lot of on sure. activities where they're able to see in higher education that uh, right. people that look like them, people that are doing things that are willing and have tossed the arrogance out and right. say that, you know, we want to connect and we want to be a part of what you are in your community. We also invite the families yeah. in. And I think that that- But Antioch, Antioch was founded, yeah, Antioch was founded on community principles. Absolutely. It might have gotten arrogant over the years and decided that they wanted to become isolated and believe in the gown concept, but it was founded on solid community principles. So I know so many Antioch graduates from my generation, one or two, but they were there and they went back. Antioch, and that's where that whole concept of internship began right. to come out. Go well, back yeah. to that community. You did summer camps. Antioch was famous for that. Oh, absolutely. And one of the first to hire uh, African American women and women of color for faculty and, and the work study right. program. And historically, part of the Niagara movement with W. Du Bois and the NAACP. Right. So right. Um, many institutions have, uh, you know, foundations that are similar, but Antioch really stands alone. And how we continue yeah. to do that is up to all of those who are uh, 
of students, former students. But Antioch has to stop being timid. It knows it has the model. So it just has to be bold and say, follow me. And if you don't have this model, you need to be closed. I mean, Antioch has to say that to the world. It can afford to say that. Yes. It's the first to start in Evergreen said, and then nobody likes to say it. But I just decided to say it, that the urban campus that we have is for adult people of color, brown and black people. And I'm bold enough to say it. it you know, it, it, it doesn't bother, you know, people, so what? You just say it, and then they say, oh, we better look at that. And it's a wonderful feeling to be to be able to look at exactly what that campus is doing in terms of black and brown people. Because somebody said, I'm going to put you in the center of the circle. Yes. In the yes. center of the circle. Being in the center of really counts and really can, in fact. Uh, oh, yes, difference. yes. Absolutely. You know, we Antioch, the Antiochs and the Goddards and Evergreens can be in the center and everything circle around them and you at the creativity, the imagination would strengthen them all. There would if we stood out, there would be no talk about banning of the books. You just it would it would be impossible to even use that language because we're so bold and so proud of being bold, you wouldn't even you wouldn't dare use that language as long as th th that those models from those places that have been first in looking at the collaboratory nature of mm -hmm. learning and knowledge, you wouldn't have any problem. Yes, and learning and doing also. Yes, learning and-, and Oh, yes, 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 yes. Yes, indeed. Yes. If you might share just a few other things before we open up for, uh, questions or and or comments so this is rarity to be able to exchange time with you so I'm so looking forward to that um, <laughs> what would you say the some of your recent experiences I I, I, I that lose you I'm sorry I was saying can that, you hear me uh, yes I can hear you okay Okay, I was saying that um, if you might share, I, I, I know you did some work with uh, when Oprah Winfrey had her Leadership Academy. Um, you've done work all over uh, the country and, and obviously in, in South Africa. And I know, I know you have, uh, since during this period of Zoom, <laughs> um, you, you've had some conversations with colleagues and friends called conversations with um, Dr. Mims or with Maxine. Yes. Any any yes. of the conversations or topics you want to share uh, that has had great impact? Because there's so so much happening now, and there's so many ways that. Well, what, we what I've been doing that now. I, I retired in 1990, and I, uh, I didn't want to. I, I still have. My memory is good, and I needed to be in the community on a regular basis. And I thought, why don't I just tell the story? So if the younger people wanted to write up something and write history and jot down, I would be still alive to answer those uh, questions because I'm not interested in the concept of legacy and all of that. So we started conversations with Dr. Mims, and I did right in the inner city, and I've been doing it now in October to be 23 years. And I have become a student in the community. So my learning and my knowledge has increased and it's really made a, it's really helped me understand some of the major gaps in education. And then I can transfer them in that discourse and that dialogue uh, with other people and get our schools. So our schools are doing quite well, but I do it the third Friday of every month. And it's it's a very good gathering. You could do it anywhere. You don't have to. You don't have to have a building. You can do it in your own house. And I'm sure it's it's like a, a study group. And and it's like for some people, like you have the Bible study, like you have temple studies, uh, uh, and people just enjoy talking. It's not an agenda. It's not a structured agenda. It just is. 
You can start it anywhere at any time. And I'll tell you, it's a very healthy model because everybody gets to be in the center. The circle is complete. Everybody gets to learn how to listen to other views and other opinions. Some, sometimes it's very challenging and you just can allow, you just allow. And you can see the growth of everybody. I know I've learned a lot. Yeah, I, I can imagine that it's been a learning experience. So now maybe we could take some time to get some questions. And I'm, uh, All right. uh, is it Sarah so, Beth or Asa or? Sarah Beth will be um, offering the questions from the audience. I would just like to pose two thoughts. Um, first of all, I would just like to um, ask Dr. Mims, as we were in conversation a few weeks ago about the voter rights issue, and as the voter rights issue rose around suppression, uh, oppression throughout the South and the Bible Belt, um, in those states more than any other states, I was asking our conversationist at that moment, Dr. Jarvis, what tips she might have or what strategies we might implore to attack that situation. So I would like to ask Dr. Mims, in view of the banned books, especially in my home region, which is the Carolinas and Georgia and all those Bible Belt states that are so adamant about which curriculums are gonna be taught, Dr. Mims, what would you recommend for parents and students and people who look like me in those communities? What would you recommend they do to circumvent that situation? Um, obviously it's been politicized, so maybe they have political power, maybe they don't. But what would you recommend to them? What would you say to help them through this, this assault, really, that's what it is? This is where you understand symbols. You cannot say Ashe, and you cannot talk about Sankofa, the bird, whose neck obviously is turned around. It's time for the bird to fly. It's time to have a mobile Sankofa partnership or club, whatever you want to call it in the area. But every neighborhood, every area, every church should understand what is trying to shrink the power of the voice of black and brown people. And it's not going to happen. Mm -hmm. It's not going to happen. We're too bold. And what's happening is the imagination is being, the key thing was to get us to enslave us in such a way we would not remember. So we were dismembered. And because of the literature and all of the various things, it's the stories that are being told, the books that are being written, we're now remembering. And that remembering is giving us power. So a lot of the things that you're hearing uh, will never happen. And you be careful on where you put your priorities so you can just shift the language and we can fight against something while something that's very serious is going on over here. And that's, what's, that's, that's why you have to watch exactly your movements and your language and be very aware that whatever you hear here has to be analyzed in your community, with your families, in your places of worship, so that you will know really, this is really, really, that's what the sad Kofa means. This is really what's happening and not necessarily this. And I think we're doing a beautiful job and I think our institutions like uh, uh, the Antiochs and the Evergreens and Goddards and stuff, I think they're coming alive. And I think our young people are just doing, my role now is just simply to affirm and confirm the next generation and allow my name and whatever I have out there to be used, no matter what. Would you think that, um maybe perhaps what the Panthers did back in the day where they had the Saturday schools? Do you, th you mentioned churches. Do you think church institutions should employ Saturday schools so that they can stand in the gap of those facts 
that are not going to be taught in. Well, you in don't the have to label them. You see, you must every time you label something and go public with it, they are having Saturday schools. Sunday school is a Saturday school. Mm. All you have to do is add another piece to that Sunday school lesson, and you have a standard. Sunday school is Saturday school. Bible study is Saturday school. All, we always have had Saturday schools. What the Panthers did, they just combined it and gave it an interdisciplinary taste, if you will, mm -hmm. and put a jazz, put a rhythm on it, and that's what they had. But we have, we have so much. For instance, uh, and just think of the brilliance, uh, the, the thing that the, the guy that gets you from place to place, the houses, you know, what did you call? You young ones use it in the car. I, all you have to do is give the address. I can't oh, think of the name right now. The GPS? Or what is it called? The GPS. GPS. What does that mean? What does that mean? Navigation? GP. Oh, what General, is GPS? Do you or, know what it means? Uh, Asa would have yeah. to give us that. I think it's a global positioning satellite. That's what. All right, Nick, yes, global positioning satellite. Long before there was a global positioning satellite, we had the institution of global positioning satellite with Harriet Tubman. So every <laughs> black and brown person, instead of saying I'm using the GPS, just say I'm using Harriet Tubman. And you'd bring her, and she would become alive. Harriet Tubman was the GPS, was a system. And instead, of, and so Harriet would become alive. And as you're driving and she's helping you get to where you're going, she would become alive. And you, there's no way you would ever ban her because she would be part of your life, not GPS. You, we need to stop saying it. Every black and brown person in America needs to stop saying, I'm going to use GPS. They even had a nerve to name the person, the AI, the artificial intelligence woman, Alexa. She should have been named Lakeisha. Because <laughs> she's able to tell you what you're doing and where you are. The, uh, every time I think about G, the, the global positioning, what? Global positioning system. Well, no, Harriet gets me where I need to go. <laughs> Chief navigator, huh? <laughs> But the interesting thing is, you know, that the GPS system, the technology for it was actually devised by an African-American woman. I don't recall but her see, name. We don't know that. Yeah, perhaps someone. We don't know call, that. Yeah, you know, remembers the name, but it was developed by an African-American woman, which means that she was probably oh working at each corporation. They took ownership of it. And we just know that as an obscure fact, you know, in just simple research. But the world doesn't but if know. You it. got in your car. If you got in your car and said, Harriet, take me to 8954 30th Street, you will be surprised what would happen to you as you elevate that energy of calling on Harriet to help you be safe. Okay. And we've got to do that. We've got to. But that's teach also our young about, children how to act. Yes, and that's about connecting to the spirits and our uh, cultural heritage. So that's, redu that reduces you from stop thinking about, I'm going to work on this band in the books. You make Harriet alive, and Harriet will get rid of it for you. <laughs> if you bring her alive, Harriet will give you the energy, or Harriet will do it, you know. Any of our ancestors would stop the book ban anything. That's all we have to do is call on them and ask, make it clear. So we need to start imploring the ancestors to correct the stuff. Oh, that's the only way we've gotten to where we are today. That's where we've gotten today. And I mean, they, they, they perform for us too. That's what the libation is all about. Absolutely, absolutely. Yes. Agreed. Sarah? Well, thank you, Dr. Mims, for giving me one of the best tips during COVID-19, because I'm a, a student who lives alone and asked Dr. <laughs> Dr. Mims was like, well, what are you doing? 
And I told her, and she was <laughs> like, well, you need to start talking to yourself. I think during this period of time, everyone should talk to themselves. So I learned to talk <laughs> to myself alone. So right. thank you so much for that tip during to survive COVID-19 and this pandemic, epidemic, whatever people want to call it. Well, whatever. And Dr. Mims, I don't know. Dr. Mims, he talks to me also, so we, we, we help you. All right. <laughs> yeah, that's good. I'm glad. Well, are we through or do I stay on? You want me to stay on or what? Yeah, we do we have some questions or, or comments there, Beth? We have a few. I think people have been shy um, in the chat, which is why I kept running my mouth, hoping that someone else would ask a question. Um, I'll put some people on the spot if I have to. I can be bodacious like that. Well, we don't. Why are we shy? I thought this was a discourse. We don't need to be shy. Why? Why are we shy? Uh, Dr. Gills and I have been around a long time, so we're not. I, I, I don't think people. Should. I am a faculty here in Seattle. And you are definitely a local legend in your work. <laughs> your, uh, Thank you. In, in, in your contributions. And I'm curious from your perspective uh, about the relationship between the schools uh, beyond, you know, I love your idea of us at the inner circle with Evergreen and uh, that vision that you have. But I also wonder, uh, I wonder what your experience was across schools, if you had that, and, and how your activism uh, reached so many places that I knew about you quickly when I moved here. Yeah, I put together a master's program for Annie uh, down here in Tacoma. And so I was able to have the piece that I just am thrilled about, I was able uh, to combine the two schools and it is wonderful and introduce those two schools. There still is a wonderful relationship between those two schools still uh, and then bring them to the community. And uh, that's the only way to operate. That's the only way to operate. Uh, when you have, I mean, Harvard is not any uh, better, if you will, than Antioch. But uh, they, their marketing is, their marketing is that we have, we, uh, out of our school, we have nine presidents. Well, it's time for Antioch to say out of our school, we have 45 social justice geniuses. All we have to do is look at the language and give it a presence and bring it to the community and applaud it. And you'd be surprised what it will do to the image. Our marketing strategies, the curriculum is the same all over the country. There's no better physicist at, at Harvard than it is in New York or Evergreen. No better, no better artist. But we need to make that bold language. That's all Harvard does. I mean, it's just says I have nine presidents or whatever they have. So what? <laughs> I think Donald Trump needs to say I graduated from Harvard. <laughs> and then that would just stop it. Hey, hello. <laughs> Hi there, Dr. Mims. This is Sue. Hello. It's so great. I to know. See you. <laughs> it's good to see you too. Hello. You're I, at Antioch. I am at Antioch and yeah, I'm I so am. Glad. I am here and actually, I hope that I am representing all of this work that you've just talked about. I was typing in the chat that you have been doing <laughs> this all of your life, even as a, as a parent, but also as a teacher back at Leshy Elementary School, <laughs> where you were my third and fourth grade teacher and, and then yes. a mentor as an administrator within Seattle Public Schools, and then creating that pathway for many of us to complete our education at Evergreen. And you told me even then, now Sue, you ought to keep going. There's this place called Antioch that you can get your doctorate <laughs> degree. I remember. <laughs> I remember. Well, did you get it? Did no, you get I it? Did. 
No, I did not. No, I did not. Are you worried about it? No, no, ma'am. <laughs> so you're, you're through now. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Yes. But I'm encouraging others. And I thank yeah, you so that's, much. That's for, important. Thank you so much for pouring in. I thank me. you for doing what you, you've done so much in education in this specific Northwest. I thank you. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, this is fun. I imagine Antioch, some Antioch students may be coming to the Seattle thing if they're going to close down some of the campuses. And I'm sorry to hear that because Antioch needs to be in every city, every state. It it has such it has such strong beginnings. I don't know. I hope it gets back to that. I don't. It may not be able to, but the model is real. To it's just bring people to the center, have the discourse and move in the community and revisit the concept of interns, which is very helpful. Yes. What is your title? Assistant Provost of Antioch, uh, Seattle. Assistant Provost? Girl, stop it. <laughs> stop it, that is wonderful. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, let's get to the next question. I'll call you. We need to do something. Okay. Marsha, you know, is dean at Tacoma campus. I Marsha do. Tate. Yes. Alanga. Yeah, yes. She's, the, she's the dean. Yes, I do know that. I was up there a couple of years ago, so I we'll have to get back up. We'll have to do that. Okay. Okay. Good to see you. Good to, Good see, to you. see you. Yeah. Yeah, I'll give it back to you, Sarah Beth. <laughs> Speaking of provosts, I want to put Mark Hauer, Dr. Mark Hauer, on, on spot because he has a history um, with Seattle as well as, um, you know, a connection with Dr. Mem. So What's I his just name? Dr. Mark Hauer. He is on the, um, on the Zoom with us. I just want to put him on the spot. And, All right. Uh, Provost so L.A. Yeah, Dr. Mims, I was in Seattle when uh, you were doing some of the work with the education folks. So good to see you. Thank you for joining us. Hello. Good to see you. Um, I'm just, in, I'm intrigued by, you've mentioned several uh, institutions, Goddard, Evergreen, Antioch, and, 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 yeah. mm -hmm. and others. And it does seem like there's some similarity that we could capitalize on. We could um, we could join together in some way. You've also mentioned kind of the, there's a certain kind of arrogance, and I I, <laughs> under, I think I understand at least some version of that. And I'm wondering how do we overcome that so that we're strengthening each other and this greater cause as opposed to getting in, in the way of it and each other. Do you have some thoughts on because that? Because Antioch, Evergreen, and I'll say Goddard. I know Goddard has closed down some aspects of his campus. It was in, in Seattle, too. Yes. You've got the boldness of being the first to A, B, C, D. You got to go back to that history. You got to go back with that Sankofa bird model and say, what can we do? I'll use the word post COVID because everything's going to be saying COVID. But you you can afford to set up a department of disparities. Mm. Those three universities are social justice. I'm going to use that. Those three universities and colleges could come together, bring the language, bring the language to our community so people can begin to feel whole and secure. Help to restore the imagination. Help to... Uh, bring alive, if you will, our senses, go back to our touch, see what is happening with our vision, see what is happening with our hearing. You know, we just throw the language out. Do we hear the word social justice or is it just there with the vision? Are we just taking part of our, our inadequate nature, if you will, and capitalized on one sense? I mean, are we just improving the vision, not the hearing. You, we, we have a responsibility to integrate all of those six senses and maybe some university can add another sense, I don't know, with the research. And everything that's a gap 
Evergreen, Annie York, Goddard, and those schools that talk about the progressive nature of their curriculum can bring that curriculum alive. All right, we're beginning. Evergreen thinks it's, it's in the woods. That's the Olympic campus. They're, they have a total brilliant approach to climate change. Brilliant. It's in the woods. Mm -hmm. The climate changes every every 15 minutes out where they're located. Antioch is sitting downtown. It used to be on 6th Avenue. Heavy traffic. A lot of concrete. All of those buildings. Can you imagine what Antioch could do for the world concerning housing for the houseless? Change that word from homelessness. To, they're out of houses. Look at what you could do with the Department of Housing and change the image of what that means. Look at what you all could do right now with Bruce Harrell and what he's trying to do in terms of the image. Mm. It's so much boldness that we've had the privilege. See, the thing that keeps happening to us, particularly those of us that have been privileged, if you will, to be faculty in these models, we now have taken it and are acting like privileged people. We're not taking it back to the community and teaching from the beginning, helping them understand the integration of senses and, and social injustice and all of that. And I think of how privileged I have been to be a faculty at Evergreen, to be given the freedom. We were given the freedom in a policy model mm -hmm. to be, to be creative. Why we aren't doing it, I, I, I don't know. I, I keep it going in, in Tacoma, and I've been very blessed that I've been able to do that. But, uh, oh, we have, there's so many places that Annie York could be, so many places. And the thing that's so sad is that you close down the campuses in California when you need the campuses in California. People are begging for you to be there but your marketing department or your department of mm, uh, isn't able to see that. You know, who wants to close campuses? Uh, for, uh, who, Evergreen and Antioch, none of those schools should ever be closed. As long as you're trying to do with the equity and inclusion or the rights, I mean, the, uh, the Roe versus Wade mm -hmm. piece, that's not just about women's rights, and, and it is, but it's about the rights that all the rights that are getting ready to be taken from us, voting rights, all of it. Right. Antioch knows that, Evergreen knows that. Well, your marketing people in the capital should immediately use some of that language right away because you're so privileged to be aware. Our awareness comes earlier than most schools. And we've been blessed in the academy to be given an opportunity to be exposed to to be rapid with our knowledge, and we could be rapid with the boldness of what we could do. I, I just hate to see us close down, and uh, just and now that we're gonna learn how to be just truly lazy with Zoom, we're gonna really get to be horrible, and our communities are gonna suffer because we turned ourselves into into privileged people. Thank you, thank you so much. Would you please, uh, if you see Marsha Tate Arunga, give her my best. I sure will. She's a dean now in Tacoma, you know. I know. Yeah. I'm really proud of her. And it's, your last spell your last name for me. H o w e r. Okay. Think of flower, except the tower. Good seeing you, and thank you for. Okay. I agree with everything you're saying. Thank you. Thank you. All right. We have Michael and uh, Tuan. Sarah Beth, did you see? Uh, I have, excuse me, I was trying to honor the process of typing. Then I looked at the clock and I'm afraid I might not have time to type it with, if I can. It's an appropriate question, I believe. Um, it's an honor to be able to ask you this question, Dr. Maxine uh, Mills. I heard about you and your work 
at the uh, Tacoma Evergreen starting with the school out of your out of your kitchen. Uh, one of your alumni is assisting me with employment. Her name is uh, um, Stephanie and uh, her name. Well, anyway, the point was this. I was wondering, could you weigh in about the recent massacre in Texas that the, uh, I mean, in New York? Uh, in Buffalo. The, huh? Yeah, in Buffalo. And also, if you have an opinion about um, um, what happened uh, with uh, the kid uh, who, it, who, who went to the, whose mother drove him to the demonstration uh, to the Black Lives Matter dis, dis, uh, demonstration, and he ended up uh, killing some people with a, a machine gun. I mean, if you have like an opinion. Um, yes. You must remember, I'm from a generation where when those massacres, uh, I'm from a generation that I understood the KKK. But you, what is frightening is that the KKK did cover up their faces. We've now reached a boldness where the young ones can walk in without even covering their faces. That's how bold this, this is a new image of the KKK, these are the grandchildren of the ones that covered their faces. And we, the, the country has tolerated that level of hate so long that now we don't even have to cover our faces because we know we're gonna be declared innocent. The young man whose mother drove him got off of five charges, was freed from five charges. So another 18, and we're going to have more and more of these mass shootings because the hatred is so deep. And we at the, I've used the word evergreen and the Antiochs and God is, are so privileged. We don't want to get into that topic because it's so painful. Yes, this, this, is, this is first degree murder. You can get off with it now. So there, we've given it, we've given the younger people permission to be bold with an A, R, I think 15, they say something like that, to do mass murders and also be freed. Money. This isn't even being discussed in the gun lobby is just, you just have a now you just, you look and say, oh, it wasn't but 10. Wasn't large. You, you see, that's the language. That's privileged language. And we have to be careful in participating in that, black and brown people, because it's aimed at us. Yes. Well, now it's, it's five o'clock. Um, so for those of you that need to um, leave, I want to say uh, thank you for coming in. Uh, on behalf of the uh, Messy Conversation team and our esteemed guests, uh, thank you. And we, we look forward to, uh, for those of you who have to leave, we look forward to seeing you on July 11th. There'll be a, announcements prior to uh, July 11th. But those of you that can stay with us, we're just going to keep Dr. Mims a, a few more minutes. Um, but we wanted to thank you for, for, for being here and for this engaging conversation. Thank you. But those of you who can stay, we look forward to it. And maybe we could get a few more questions or comment. And Sarah Beth is looking things over for us. There's a, a lot of gratitude in the chat. Um, I don't see if there's any questions here. Uh, maybe I'm missing something. But I also think Clarence had a question. Uh, is that right? Clarence didn't have a question, but Clarence can always ask a question. <laughs> yeah, there's a lot of love for you, Dr. Mims, in the chat. And a lot oh, of people thank you. Asking, thank you very much. A lot of people asking for thank you, you. To, to come back to Dr. Mims with us again. Come back where? To visit, oh, visit us yeah, on this conversation. I, listen, I didn't, I didn't do anything on Zoom. I know, I, mm, in, in, I've been in this business since 1950. That's many, many, many years. 
But as long as it helps me, as long as I'm learning, I'm fine. And I'm learning a lot. I'm now a student of the world. And it's just been wonderful. Keep your health so you can retire and be able to be that. It's, it's, it's just so wonderful to be able to look at different approaches to things. And it, it's calming. Yes. Very calming. And I wanted to add that there are many students on in this particular uh, messy conversation. So they had an opportunity to, um, you know, hear your thoughts and perspectives, which are so important. And one of the things that we, we try to do and probably don't do as much along the same lines you were talking about this total and critical engagement, we try to bring uh, speakers into to our classrooms and now through Zoom. Uh, mm -hmm. So the students are yeah. able to uh, witness um, other ideas and perspectives and what, what people are doing. And I think that really helps uh, support the, your, your, your theory or philosophy uh, about uh, moving away from the arrogance and learning for one another and the kind of interchange yeah. we really need. Got to. Yes, absolutely. You know, I live to see that in this the science world, the science labs are always better funded and uh, larger than the art studio. Hmm. Art labs are smaller always. So that tells you that the painter in how you add is less than the scientist. Hmm. And yeah. once you grow up that way, then the, the artists are always uh, then thinks I'm broken, I'm poor, and I never, I'm, I'm not worthy. My work is not worthy. Da, 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 da. And that's not true. And the scientist thinks I can just walk right out. And that's just, that's confirmed in our images. We've got to re image that. We got to image, re image, and then shift the premise. Mm. Absolutely. Yeah. And that takes a lot of peeling and de decolonization, detoxifying. You've got to take the negative language and turn it into positive. We've got to allow our creativity to just swell. We've got to challenge everything that's happening in higher ed. Everything. Lerone Bennett, uh, in, this, in his uh, great book of essays, uh, Challenge to Blackness, says that uh, in the spirit of some of the historically black colleges like Morehouse, he said that uh, we have to uh, begin to see education in new perspectives and create right. a new uh, language That's in right. the sense of engagement in education. And I think that pretty well speaks to what you've been saying to us for the last hour. Yes. Certainly. Jack, I have a question for you guys. Oh, hi. <laughs> I'm so excited. Hi, Jacqueline. <laughs> um, greetings from California. And I'm, so, I'm getting emotional because I'm getting excited. So excuse that part of it. But um, I was trying to type a question. I was sitting here reading through your curriculum over the 1960s um, for, for things that happened in Washington, D.C. and how this curriculum um, was written out. I also had questions not only about the language in the curriculum, but the fact that what references that you found were um, well utilized or could be well utilized for young teens? That's the, the, the question that I had because I have a I use this language when I am working with young teens, when I am working with young adults to bring their attention to certain things and for them to delve into their history a little bit more. What I have found is with without handing out individual books and individual writers and individual timelines? Is there something that I could be utilizing that accumulates it all into one area? Because the project 1619, 
that's the newest thing for us. And I was wondering if there's something else that we could be utilizing. Now, if, if you, yeah, yeah, your own life, your own, your own family's life. If you have 1619, which is an external model for your family, you also have the year that your grandmother was born or your grandfather. And there's a story there. And if you don't know the facts, you can turn it into an image and give him, let him become uh, a hero in the family. Let the, let the grand, great grandfather become a hero and give him, uh, call him Superman, superhero, and give him a name. Let your family give this great grandfather that they've never met in the flesh a name and begin imagining things he must have done. We don't know whether it's true or not, but we don't know what we're reading is true. Why can't you write something and it not be true? So what? Who cares? What we're trying to do is to get make sure that power in that family comes through a, a way so that everybody can consider themselves worthy. You would become the matriarch in that family. Just telling the story about this great great grandfather that you really never met but I, I bet you know some things and that's your language that's right, once upon right. a time or, yeah. or if you don't want to do once upon a time you can say long before the world and that that's huge power long before the world was even thought of my great 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 and go back to seventh generation grandfather was born in and spell some city backwards and you've got your African name. <laughs> it's so funny. I'm so glad you said that because I actually had to do that the other day when I was talking to one of my former students who is four, 40, 40 years old, how, how my grandfather was the one that was financially savvy. So he's the one that taught us, yes, you have to invest. Yes, you have to save. Yes, you have to have bonds. And I was trying to get this across to her, but I couldn't pull a reference book. So I was just telling her about, about my grandfather and how he used to, when he would talk to someone, he used to spell everything because he never got past the eighth grade, but he was still a sponge. He, he took in information like a sponge and he would remember every single word he heard it, every single word that he could use wow. later on that would benefit him and you know overall benefited our family in the way that because he, he knew someday he knew in his spirit he knew someday in his spirit you would come wow. along so you're the generation that they prayed for I hope, I hope so. I'm trying to keep up with them. No, you don't <laughs> hope. See, I, I, I what you just did. I, I just confirmed you, and and because you're not I used to being applauded and confirmed, you said, I hope so. They they did a lot of hoping, and, and the word hope was misplaced with help. Help causes dependency. Ooh. Hope doesn't. Mm. Mm. I can use that. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> but that's what you're that's what you're using. You're using hope instead of help, but you want to get back to help so you can work hard, hard and and survive. You you you, you love the pathology of survival. I do, I do, I do. And that the power yeah. of surviving. And that's how we've been colonized. Mm. Well, we know for sure decolonization is needed. Oh. That's, that's what definitely sure. Yeah. yeah. Well, it's it's almost 515. And I, I think unless there's any other uh, comments, we just want to uh, thank Dr. Mims and, and really thank Clarence for introducing this wonderful, wonderful sister to us, to us all. This has been a great Thank you. 45 minutes or however long. <laughs> Lost track of time. It's been okay. wonderful. 
And to see your face light up when you saw Sue Byers. <laughs> <laughs> and to think um, there's so, there are so many students. And by the way, Jacqueline is a former student, Dr. Mims, in, a, in, the, in my uh, undergrad class at African American Studies, as well as Clarence. And Caitlin is still on. And then I have a friend, Peggy Aldrich, that I've been knowing since I was 16 years of age. Her family came uh -huh. from Tennessee, I'm sorry, from uh, Texas, and uh, my family from Detroit, Michigan. And then I had another uh, good friend, Aunt um, Carolyn Fitzgerald. She was the one from Tennessee. So we have been in contact all of these years and connecting to our families and backgrounds. And uh, uh -huh. I actually had some of their family members join my classes in the past, talking about their experiences. So I think we're trying to keep that connection going. And, and the centerpiece is, of course, Antioch. And hopefully we can move forward because there's yes. a lot to move forward about <laughs> out here yes. for us today. Yes. So we thank That's you for beautiful. the time. And um, we, we will definitely be, be in contact. All right. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you so, so much, much, Dr. Mendes.